Hey, it's me, Vicky Marie. How are we all? I'm just trying to work out why this hasn't isn't coming up on my computer. Anyway. Anyway, hope you're all good. Have you had a nice Sunday? I've had a really nice Sunday. It is Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> because Manchester City won today in the derby. So that always means for a good Sunday for me. Anyway, I'm going to start off by saying hello. Uh, I'm trying to... Oh, gosh, yeah. There you go. It's coming. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Can't turn the sound down now. Oh, anyway, I'm trying to look on through two screens. I'm trying to do so that I can look at the chat on one screen. And then, uh, anyway, I'm experimenting. So, there you go. Anyway, so, yeah. Hi. Now, tonight, I'm going to talk about Tia Sharp. Uh, the other day when we were talking about uh, poor little uh, Madeline Soto, who looks like her stepfather, Stefan Stearns, has done something to her. He's been arrested anyway. Poor Madeline has been found um, unalived, not alive. Uh, and it looks very much like this twonk, this stepfather, Stefan Stern, has has done this to her and it, it put me in mind of the case of Tia Sharp and um, I, I thought I'd done a video about Tia. I do tend to avoid doing videos about children, about true crimes that involve children because it's very upsetting isn't it? Uh, but I did think, I don't know why, that I had done a video about Tia uh, and it turns out I haven't. So, you know, when I look through my videos, I couldn't find the video. So I think what must have happened was I just talked about it, maybe mentioned it in passing. So that's decided me to do a video about Tia's case. And can you believe, I mean, I'm sure those of you in the UK will definitely remember this case of Tia Sharp because it was a very high profile, profile case. Uh, Tia was missing for a little while and so there was... Um, you know, a lot of searches to try and find her. There were vigils from the community. Uh, there were interviews with the family. You know, it was a very, very high-profile case while Tia was missing. She was 12 years old when she went missing. She just had her 12th birthday. Um, now, it, it, it's quite strange, isn't it, because Madeline had just had a birthday as well. Makes you wonder if that, like the birthdays, these twonks that have been sort of lying in wait, if you like, like sharks, uh, you know, waiting to pounce. If after a birthday, you know, when they're that little bit older and they think, oh, yeah, you know, they're old enough now, or, you know, if that's some sort of thing that they, that means something, you know, to them, because it's very strange that Madeline had just had a birthday and um, Tia also had just had a birthday. But anyway, can you believe that this actually happened uh, over 10 years ago now? Because this was this case of Tia Sharp was in 2012. So it's literally over 10, over 10 years ago. So it feels like it only happened yesterday. But, um, you know, poor Tia, poor Tia. Anyway, we're going to talk. That's the case we're going to talk about tonight. And also, we are going to talk about uh, a little bit about Madeleine Soto as well, this other case. Uh, some things that I just want to show you about that case. But the, the, the reason uh, I want to talk about this is because this is so important because you don't know who you're bringing into your home, you know, especially if you're a single parent, male or female, because it's not only it tends to happen more with single mothers, of course, but uh, because there are more single mothers than single fathers. But there was a case not that long ago in America 
uh, with Gannon Stouch. Uh, that's a case that maybe I should cover one day. And it was his stepmom that unfortunately did away with him. It, it wasn't on an SEX. I think when those sort of things happen uh, with a stepmother, it's not normally uh, with an SEX mo motive like it is with uh, stepfathers or grandfathers. This is a step-grandfather that we're going to be talking about tonight in uh, the Tia Sharp case. Um, I think when it happens with stepmothers, but it does happen quite often, uh, when stepmothers actually do something to their stepchildren, it's not exclusively men, but as I say, normally not an SEX motive the other way around. Um, but it's a lesson to learn, isn't it? It's very, you know, because in today's society, relationships do tend to break down more often than maybe they used to. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. You know, years ago, people would have stayed together, whatever was going on. And sometimes it's not good for relationships to stay together, is it? But um, the, the, the thing that the question that it does bring in is, um, you know, when you take somebody else into your home, like a blended, there's a lot of blended families out there, isn't there? You know, people meet each other uh, and they've already got children. Maybe then they end up having children together, but they've got the children from their previous relationships. And it can cause problems for all sorts of reasons, not just for predatory reasons. You know, it, it can cause problems. But of course, the worst thing is when you invite a predator into your home without even knowing it. You know, so you, uh, you already have children maybe with somebody else and you bring somebody into your home. And then it turns out that they're just a predator, like a shark, a crocodile, waiting in the wings for the right moment. And boom, that's it. And your loved, your beloved child or grandchild, in this case, is, um, you know, a victim of it. And I think there's some other things about this Tear Sharp case that I think are, uh, uh, you know, red flags, if you like, because this, the family uh, where, you know, Tia's family where she was living, her mother was in a new relationship. Uh, social services had been um, round there th or contacted or round there three times because in the, her mother's relationship there was domestic violence and substance abuse. So that is why Tia would spend a lot of time at her grandma's because that was where she would go to get away from, you know, whatever problems were happening in her mum's relationship. So, you know, this is awful as well, isn't it? There's no refuge for Tia. She was going round to her grandmother's house because she wanted to get out of the toxic atmosphere at her, her, her mother's house. I'm not saying her mother didn't love her or, uh, or anything, but I'm just saying, uh, to, you know, social services uh, had been sort of round there three times. There, was, there were, were circumstances that of domestic violence and substance abuse. So Tia would go to her grandma's for a refuge, for, a, um, you know, a sanctuary. And there, her grandma's was this predator just waiting for his moment. And, you know, and he did wait a little while, you know, he because this guy, let's have a look at some photos first of all. In fact, let me say hello to everyone first. Because otherwise, I'll start talking and I'll forget. So let me just say hello. There's a lot of you there. Thank you for being here. And I, I, as always, thank you for everyone who's subscribed, everyone who likes my videos. Thank you so much. Special thanks to my members. Thank you to anyone who supported my channel in any way, especially emails and things. You know, people have sent me some very interesting uh, links, one of which... I'm going to show tonight later, which I wouldn't have seen unless that uh, subscriber had sent it to me. Uh, thank you to every anyone who's bought me a Kofi, uh, sent me a super. Any way you've supported my channel, thank you so much. Okay, so let's just say hello to everybody. Hi, Wesley. Hi, Chumba. Hi, David. Hi, Kelly. Uh, 
Hi, Tina. Hi, Susan. <laughs> hi, Shelly, just in case you're watching at home. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi, Jackie. Hi, Yvonne. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Oh, I'm on the big telly. Hi, Simara. Good morning. Hi, Amanda. Sydney, Australia. It's good morning there. Hi, Matthew. Yeah, R.I.P.T. It was very, very sad. This little girl, she was let down so much. She's let down by by everyone, even her own family. And as I say, I know her mum and her grandma, they were heartbroken when Tia died. But, you know, they, it, they, well, I'm going to sort of tell you the story. And hi, Amethyst. You, you do have to think about who you bring into your home, you know, to, uh, you know, because this guy wasn't a surprise that he was, you know, he had a history. Anyway. Let me say hello to everyone. Hi, Charlie. Yeah. Hi. Yes, Rio. Right. It's true. You've got to be so careful. Um, you know, you can keep them. Well, I don't know how you keep them at arm's length, to be honest. Oh, sorry to hear that, Simara. I mean, of course, it can work out, you know. And there are some blended families out there. The thing is, we don't get to hear about all the blended families that work, do we? What we get to hear about are like the headlines from these horrible tragedies that happen. Uh, but there are lots of families out there. So I'm not saying, uh, you know, never do it. I'm just saying you just have to be careful. You do have to be careful. Okay, so... Let's get into this story about, uh, into Tia's story. And this is Tia's story. It's important that it's not forgotten as well. Um, because Tia meant something, the poor little thing. She only had 12 years of life. And her life was taken away by probably one of the people that she trusted most. That always just makes it worse somehow, doesn't it? You know, you, you it's bad enough to get, you know, somebody... Uh, some terrible thing to happen with some stranger, that's bad enough. But to the person that you trust, you know, the, well, we'll see that on the day uh, that Tia died, she was walking around the supermarket with her granddad. She called him granddad. Uh, she, she had complete trust in him. There was no... Um, you know, it was, was not worried about um, being with him. You know, she'd spent m many, many evenings with him. So let's get a bit, I'm just going to put her picture up and then we'll get a bit of the background of what happened. So this is a, a photo of Tia when she was uh, younger. Let me just, why can I not turn, I have to. Hang on. I can turn the sound down on that. Then I can see. Sorry, I'm just trying to work out how I can look at it on the other screen. just not happening <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time but anyway let's see if i can see it on here oh i can see there it is on <clears throat> okay so here's tia a couple of years before she died you know she's a little bit younger there now when tia um the the strange thing if you like or one of the many strange things about tia's story is in fact her be, years before this all happened Tia's mum actually uh, let's have a look at, at him so this is Tia Tia Sharp just coming into adolescence 
you know, you can see, look, she's got a little bit of makeup on there. Uh, she was just sort of growing up, you know, she was just coming to that point where she would be a teenager and she never got a chance to become a teenager. Now, what I want to just look at now, so this is him, this is Stuart, this is her granddad. Now, he was 10 years younger than her grandma. And they'd been to get this as her grandma, but they'd been together quite a long time. Um, you know, so it wasn't as if he'd only just come into the household. But the, what I always thought strange when I first heard about this was years before when Tia was only two years old, this uh, Stuart Hazel, he had had a brief relationship with the mother, uh, Natalie. So Tia's mother, Natalie, had had a very, very brief relationship with Stuart Hazel. And then after that, he started having a relationship with her mother, which, you know, I'm sorry, always seemed to me really horrible, you know, just just awful. Because could you imagine going out with your daughter's ex-boyfriend or could you imagine your mother going out with your ex-boyfriend um i just think you know it's it's just not nice is it so that's something that all oh, this is uh tia's mother here natalie so when tia was two only two years old stuart hazel had a relationship with natalie as time went on then, it didn't work out. I mean, I think it was really brief. It might, it was like literally two weeks or something. Um, and then here he is, the twonk. Um, then he started having a relationship with Tia's grandma. And that was a serious relationship. He ended up moving in with her and he was with her for quite a long time. But it just always seemed a bit icky to me that he'd had this relationship uh, with, with, with the daughter, you know, as well. Just strange. But anyway, that's what happened. Now, I need to tell you a little bit about Stuart Hazel. Um, I mean, this is it. He was a, an absolute twonk, basically. Uh, they, they must have known he was. He had a reputation for being violent. Um, he, he'd had quite an unfortunate background, to be fair, himself. His father was in and out of prison. His mother, uh, at times, what was worked in the was a sex worker. He himself had to go into care, and uh, allegedly he was, you know, abused himself while he was in care. So obviously this is where all these problems started. You know, this is, you know, he's, he's, he's not come from the best background, you know, no, I accept that, but you know, lots of, as I always say, lots of people come from terrible backgrounds, but they do not uh, go on to, you know, abuse and murder children. But I, you know, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Uh, when he had that very brief relationship with uh, Tia's mum, was he already, uh, maybe he didn't think of it because Tia was only two then. Maybe, it, it, you know, but was that the start of it all, you know, because he had like an obsession with Tia, it turned out. He'd been videoing her secretly, um, you know, uh, videos and photos came to light after his arrest where he had been sort of standing over her while she was sleeping and videoing her while she was sleeping videoing her um secretly watch with her putting moisturizer on her legs and you know he 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 gradually over time became became completely obsessed i think with tia but so let's just have a look at um what my one of my favorite YouTubers has got to say about it. About Stuart Hazel. So just to give us a bit of a background, you know. Um, let 
me just make sure that's yeah okay let's have a look but uh so this is that uh, that chapter um mike one of my favorite youtubers and i just want to show you what he says about stuart hazel at a young age, while his father was in prison and had little contact with his mother, who had worked as a prostitute. From a young age, he was involved in petty crime and had started drinking at the age of 13. He was often in trouble at school. His first conviction came when he was 14, and he later ended up at a homeless hostel where he claimed he was raped age 16. He had a history of depression, self-harm, suicide attempts, drug use and alcoholism. Is there, that's Nasty Nick there from EastEnders that is having his photo taken with, if any of you have ever watched EastEnders. And had a history of convictions going back to 1991, including disorderly behaviour, racially aggravated assault, dealing the devil's dandruff, possessing a machete, grievous bodily harm, and burglary and theft, and had been imprisoned three times. Tia lived with her mother. So... He wasn't exactly the ideal person that you'd want your daughter or your granddaughter to be around. So he had all that. I think 100% um, they knew, you know, they knew his background. So that estate that they lived on, the thing is the way those council estates work, and I know because I've lived on one, they, uh, they're very sort of incestuous, if you like. Everybody knows everybody's business. There's no way that Tia or a mom or, or there's no way that in that community, there's no way that they wouldn't have known Stuart Hazel's history. Um, but despite that, you know, they both had a brief, well, what uh, Tia's mom had a brief re relationship with him and Tia's grandma ended up living with him. So, you know, there must have been, he must have had something, I suppose. Now, Tia's grandma, worked at care home and um you know that particular night this fateful fateful night so of course tia had spent many weekends there as i say she would go there for a refuge from whatever problems were going on at home uh with her mother and her, her mother's partner tia would go to her grandma's and she would get spoiled there you know you know what it's like if you're if she's living in quite a chaotic household and there are other children in that household. Uh, it would be nice for her, wouldn't it, to get out to her grandma's. Grandma would spoil her. Her granddad would spoil her. You know, he fought the world of her. I mean, you could see um, that Tia was very comfortable in Stuart Hazel's presence from the CCTV on the day that she was murdered, bless her. You know, they were going around the supermarket choosing things. You know, she, she, they were on the bus. She looked completely comfortable in his presence. I just cannot imagine how that must have been for Tia when it all went wrong that night. Now, there's also, I wonder, did he plan it? Because that night, um, Christine, the grandma, she was working. And it was, I think it was Stuart Hazel who actually invited Tia over to sort of keep him company while Christine was doing a night shift at the care home where she worked. So it makes you wonder, does it? Did he plan it? Did he plan it that night? Because it was after her birthday, she'd just turned 12. Was he thinking, oh, now's the time? Uh, you know, or was it, was it really just, you know, on that? Because he was a drinker. Stuart Hazel is a drinker or was a drinker. So did he just get so drunk and then just lost control? You know, we'll never know. Only Stuart Hazel knows what he did and why he did it and why he did it that particular night and how he ever thought he would get away with it uh, or maybe just didn't think because he was so drunk. You know, uh, only he knows that, whether he's ever going to tell anyone, I don't know. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, that chapter channel, I really like it. It's one of my favourite ones. Yeah, he always refers to it as the devil's dandruff, David. Uh, yeah, I like the coffee house Adrian one as well. 
uh, Simar. I do like Adrian as well on that one, the coffee house crime. That's another one of my favorite one. Favorite ones. Yeah, so hi Desi. Um Right, so where are we going now? Because I've got so many things that I want to show you. Um, because I've got all these windows open. Let me close some down because... Uh, I've got some things open that I don't need to. Hang on. So what happened that fateful night? Um, of course, it's it's not known exactly what time it all happened. There were some uh, messages exchanged between um, Tia and her grandma. Or, uh, sorry, Stuart Hazel and his wife, uh, not wife, his partner. There were messages exchanged. Everything seemed fine, you know. But it's, at some point. At some point that night, everything just went to pot or to plan, whichever way you look at it. You know, let's have a look at some photos of... Uh, we don't really want to look at Stuart Hazel, but we have to, really. So, I've got too many windows open. Some I have literally have because I can't find it right. I've got to be brutal. Put them down. All right, let's try again. See if I can actually find. Oh, so many there. That, um... Okay, here we go. So yeah, here's some pictures of him. Um, he was interviewed. Oh no, I'm I'm racing ahead of myself. Let me see. So. Anyway, there was some text exchanged between Tia and her grandma. Uh, sorry, not between Tia and her grandma, between Stuart Hazel and his partner. Everything seemed fine. And then the next day, Tia disappeared, just disappeared into thin air. Well, as we know, people don't just disappear into thin air, do they? And Stuart Hazel, he said that she came downstairs uh, we'll be watching the interview in a minute that he gave. He said, she came downstairs, she said she was going into town, off she went, up the path, uh, didn't take her phone with her because he said to her, your phone needs charging, and he told her to leave her phone, and, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous really, isn't it? I mean, what, she had one of those Blackberries, do you remember when they were uh, popular? Because, um, of course, this is over 10 years ago, so... Uh, it, nowadays it'd be even more unusual for a young person not to take the phone but certainly then it was already unusual uh, he said he'd said to her not to take a phone because it needed charging off she went and that was it she just never came home so that led to this uh, you know that she had to be um, reported missing uh, it led to a huge sort of uh, police inquiry, etc. And I think really f immediately the police were suspicious of Stuart Hazel because of his background, you know, because of his offences. He'd been to prison for violent offences, etc. And due to the fact that as soon as they learned that he was not a blood relative, you know, that he was the step-grandfather, as opposed to, you know, a blood grandfather. The police were, all, you know, their spidey sense was already telling them that it was like, you know, police have intuition they, uh, and they, that their intuition was telling them already that um, Stuart Hazel may well have more to do with this than, you know, he's, he's letting on. But they searched the house. Now, the thing is, Stuart Hazel did not have a car. So, you know, there was not much he could do. Uh, you know, they're thinking, well, what's he done with Tia? Because they searched the house twice, in fact, and did not find Tia. 
So they're thinking, well, where is she then? If uh, you know, that must have caused a little bit of doubt as to whether he was guilty because what had he done with the body? You know, if he had done something to Tia, what could he have done uh, with Tia's body without a car? Anyway, uh, so what happened was uh, ITV went to do an interview with him. There is our old friend, Mark Williams Thomas. You know, and I think about this now, I think, how did he end up doing an interview with uh, Stuart Hazel? But he was working for... Um, he was working for the ITV then. So, you know, he was, I suppose, you know, a, a candidate to interview Stuart Hazel. But apparently he says um, that he was told by the police and Martin Brunt also, because that's his mate, isn't it? it was, there's this trio, isn't there? Martin Brunt, uh, Mark Williams, Thomas, and of course, Peter Folding. And Martin Brunt said they were told, ask whatever questions you want, you know, by the police. And that makes you feel that the police were trying to lure um, Stuart out to make a mistake, really, wasn't it? So, uh, but let's have a look at the interview that he gave. Tell me a little bit about Tia's life i mean is she a happy girl is she jolly has she got any problems no she's got no problems at all she's she's a happy go lucky like golden angel you know what i mean she's 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 perfect she's no. i mean this twonk this he's got this picture of tia behind him he's this is in the house where he's murdered her maybe even murdered her on that sofa and uh she's upstairs in the attic her body is upstairs in the attic as he's given this interview, I mean, how cold do you have to be, you know, to be able to sit there and lie, knowing that that girl, you've murdered that girl who you, he's saying he, he thinks of like his own daughter, and not only he's murdered her, but she's, her body's upstairs in the attic, and he's sat there giving this interview. Just unbelievable, isn't it? Oh. Arguments, no, nothing, no, nothing we can think of, absolutely nothing. So Tia stays here Thursday night, yeah. just with you, Christine's working. Talk me through Friday up until the last time you see her. Tell me exactly what you did. Tia's come down the stairs uh, around about half 10, 11, something like that, maybe. I'm not you can tell that he's really struggling for what to say. Uh, and I was reading about him, people were saying, because he, he's forgotten what he said to, you know, the thing is, when you tell lies, you have to remember what you've said to who. If you tell the truth, you're always saying the same thing, so you don't really have to think about it. He's probably, he's probably thinking, right, hang on, what did I say last time? Uh, you know, thinking he's got to be careful that he doesn't say the wrong thing. <clears throat> hasn't he so um and also people have made a, a big thing of the fact that his ears are red here and apparently when you tell lies your ears go red so i think that i think that's probably true actually and the way he's looking away he's thinking you know you you can tell that he's not telling the truth i think i know she was on about going up to for an uh about she wanted to get up early she picked up bird i mean mark does look very suspicious mark's like looking at him like that and you know i know i always uh poke a bit of fun at mark williams thomas but i suppose he must have some instinct somewhere because he's been a detective hasn't he and he's um <clears throat> he must have developed some sort of instinct i suppose but I still it's ever since he said oscar pistorius is innocent i just can't uh, you know, to me, then I, I don't, it's not that I don't believe in he, he, he's got an instinct, it's because I think he'll do anything for money. Your mum's DS up, played the DS for a little while. I said, well, we're going to have some breakfast. So she, I made her some toast and she had toast and then she wanted a sausage roll because she's always eating sausage rolls. Uh, oh God, it's so cold, isn't it? That he's making up all those things. So she had some toast and she wanted a sausage roll all the time knowing that he's already, he's murdered her. She's not 
having any toast or any sausage roll he's uh, probably that morning that he's saying he's making a toast and giving her a sausage roll in fact what he was doing <clears throat> was wrapping her body up in bin bags and putting it in the attic just uh foul absolutely foul man uh, and her little face there behind smiling and him saying all the all these lies and you can tell it's lies as well because there's too much detail in what he says but just the thought of him saying that he gave a toast and a sausage roll when really what he was doing was wrapping up her body and putting it in the attic uh, basically and then she was sitting there she doesn't take a washing up out so i took her washing up out um just started doing a little bit of washing up in the kitchen she was in there she was telling me what she was doing but i weren't really logging it into my head i didn't you know what i mean remember like the kids they talk to you it goes in one ear it stays there for a second it goes out you know what i mean as i was hoovering then she walked yeah look at mark <laughs> he's like he is really sort of uh you can tell he's thinking mm. you know i'm sure he's had enough experience talking to twonks that he would have been a bit suspicious of uh, Stuart. i don't know don't know how he came over to him, but... She walked past me from the front room to go out. And she walked out the front door, that is all I know. And she left her phone on charge because I told her to sit there. She left her fucking phone on charge. I mean, you know, he's so inappropriate the way he's talking. But, you know, he's... Um, this is... He's, comes from this sort of estate, doesn't he, where they're like... You know, he's... Uh, he's He's not a, uh, what's the word? He reminds me a bit, bit of Mick Philpot, you know, and those sort of, that's another video that I need to do one day about the Philpots, you know, and that sort of environment that they come from is just like, just awful. He's an awful man. And you really, you know, I can't help but think, how was he ever let near Tia because of his history? You know, you know, he's been in and out of prison, uh, having machetes, violence, you know, drug dealing. Why was he ever let near that little angel? Yeah, leave her phone on charge. I didn't mean leave it on charge because what's here doing? She plays on the on the the BB thing, but then she uses it as it's charging. So there's no charge going through to it. So when I said to her, leave, just leave your phone on charge. It means leave her phone on charge, not use it, let it charge up a bit. Then you can actually take it with you or whatever, because she's been responsible to go to court before. She's been responsible to go on trains and buses and trams and everything before on her own. So, so when she walked past you and, and out to the door, did she say anything? Uh, she said, uh, oh, goodbye. Uh, uh, she said, uh, uh, you know, he, do, he, he is struggling. That's it. When you tell lies, uh, you've just got to remember everything you've said. And he was really struggling then. Well, I said, well, make sure you're back at six. She went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was it. And then the door closed and she walks out. I don't take precise times and things like that. But when she walked out that door, I know damn well it was 10 past 12, according to my clock. Because as I was hoovering up the dog's nest by, the, by my kitchen, I look up and I've got a great big clock in front of me on the cooker. It says 12.10. Now, listen, you've been living... Oh, he said, as I was hoovering up the dog's mess. Uh, he wasn't, wouldn't have been the dog's mess he was hoovering up, would it? It'd be the mess, whatever mess he'd created, uh, doing whatever he did to poor Tia. And he did some awful things. I mean, as I say, they don't know all the details because um, by the time they found Tia, she was quite badly decomposed. But they do know some of the details because they found... Uh, pictures that he'd hidden, but we'll talk about those in a moment, and they're quite upsetting actually. In house arrest, basically, almost yeah. for the last seven days, almost now. Yeah. How's that been? Oh, it's been horrible. It's been horrible. Do you know what I mean? The family's we're stuck inside here. Do you know what I mean? We've got all the uh, papers outside, all putting accusations down, and they asked me stupid questions yesterday. Like, oh, did you do anything? I said, Well, no, I didn't excuse my language but no i didn't i'd never think of that i'd love her to be she's like my own daughter for god's sake we had that sort of relationship it was that sort of thing it was just you know god you know yeah like my own daughter she wanted it she got it 
She's got no, she's got a loving loving home. She's she's never gone without anything. So I can't work it out. What the hell's going on? We're all out there. They want to report the truth. So do you feel under pressure? Do you feel that that perhaps the the people are looking at you? Now this is Tia's uncle. Look at him looking at him. <laughs> I wonder what he was thinking then, because the family initially they really supported Stuart you know they knew that he was under um, suspicion and the family just would they defended him uh, but I do think he's looking at him a bit strange though it must have been going through his mind it must have been going through his mind that he might have done something be but or what did they trust him so much because when it all came out that it was Stuart Hazel that had done it, the family were absolutely incredulous, which su always surprises me, because what sort of a person was he? Well, if they believe what they read in the papers, they can do whatever they like, because I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. She walked out of there, and I know damn well because she was seen walking down the pathway. I know she made that track down to that way. What happened after that is I don't know. Okay, so there you go. Now, as we know, it was a total load of rubbish now because we know what what the truth is now. Um, but, you know, he, that's what he said. So <clears throat> that's where we were, if you like, then. Then what happened? So twice the police went and searched that house. And then the only reason it came to light in the end, I don't know what he thought he was going to do. I, I mean, I don't expect he really thought much. He doesn't look like someone who thinks a lot, you know, like, or he's very, he's not very intelligent. He obviously didn't think any of it through. Oh, but there was an added complication, though, for the police, because the neighbour, for some unknown reason, the next door neighbour confirmed that he had seen Tia come out of the door, go out of the gate and leave the house. So this made everything even more sort of complicated because the police, although they thought, now I've got, um, I had an article on that somewhere or a photo of him. Um, it's got so many bloody windows open. Oh, it's okay, I can find it now. Yeah, um, it was all made worse because the neighbour confirmed Stuart's story. So although the police right from the beginning um, were convinced, really, that Stuart had something to do with it, it was complicated by the fact that the neighbour, Paul Meehan, the neighbour, I mean, what a twonk he is. You know, I've often wondered about this and I've thought, was he somehow in on it or, or was he really just that? that stupid or that awful uh, that he gave a false statement. So this is the Manchester Evening News. It's jumping about, as always, which is so annoying. Here he is, Paul Meehan. So he was uh, Stuart Hazel's neighbour. And he actually said he had seen Thea. So that just made it even more complicated for the police so he ended up being jailed for five months which i think he got off lightly to be honest because talk about wasting police time because he totally led the although the police immediately had their suspicions of stewart when the neighbor then this idiot paul came out and said he had seen her walk past his home on the day after she was killed you know and and confirmed Stuart's story um that just you know led the police off on a wild goose chase really thinking oh well maybe Tia did leave the house and go into Croydon so he was jailed for five months for wasting police time by giving a false statement they had seen her, her alive Paul Meehan 40 who lived next door to Christine Bickle a uh, Bicknell and her murderer boyfriend Stuart Hazel told detectives investigating the schoolgirl's disappearance that he saw her walk past his home on August the 3rd. 
So the bus driver told officers he was 100% sure he had seen her, but she was already dead in fact by then. So he was convicted of causing wasteful employment of the police by making a false report. So can you imagine, uh, you know, how that the police then would have to start looking at CCTV on buses or, you know, they'd have to, he's, he's said he's given 100% certain that she's walked past his house. So he totally led the police off from the track. They were on the right track and he led them off and it's, it makes you wonder why he did that. But they did say they thought um, there was no suggestion that he was in league with Hazel. But, you know, I'm not... It sounds as if he is. Why would he do that? Unless... <coughs> the only reason he might do that is if he trusted... Uh, you know, everyone seemed to trust Stuart Hazel for some reason the family, all the people around him trusted him implicitly. Why? I don't know. But, uh, you know, and if he did, and then maybe he was just trying to be important, you know, and get, you know, maybe he believed Stuart that she had gone off into town. So he was just trying to, you know, uh, sort of get feel important by giving the police a statement. Who knows? I mean, you just can't get you. You can't put yourself in these people's heads who do these crazy things. Anyway, apparently he remained impassive as the verdict was delivered. And as the hearing adjourned, he sat down and buried his head in his hands. And this is uh, Christine, the mother, uh, sorry, Christine, the grandma and the mother arriving at the court. So... Oh, and not only he said he'd seen her, but he gave a detailed and vivid description of what she was wearing. And this delayed the police from interviewing Hazel earlier. Uh, you know, his explanation is that he confabulated seeing her. His brain mate mistakenly filled in the blanks in good faith. You know, maybe some t maybe if you'd seen her often walking past this house, sometimes you can think you see things, I suppose. But anyway, the prosecutor said that he deliberately lied, possibly to put himself in an important position in what was then a missing persons inquiry. And she said it was possible he was attention seeking and was puffed up by being important to the inquiry. Yeah. Well, anyway, so he got, uh, he'll be out now, obviously, this was years ago. Um, he got his, he had to go to uh, prison because of it, five months. I just can't, but, you know, you just cannot really get your head around that, can you? That anyone would do that. <clears throat> Hi, Chumba. Everyone was missing you, Chumba. Hi, Maggie. So, so in the meantime, uh, Stuart Hazel has been to the vigil. He's going around wearing a Bring Tia Home t-shirt or, you know, Missing Tia t-shirt. They had all these t-shirts made up. The whole community is out in support uh, for uh, him and Christine, Tia's grandma. You know, it's just like uh, this massive... I can just imagine what it's like because they like a bit of drama on these estates as well. Do you remember Sharon Matthews when she went missing and the whole community came out and what? That that's what happens on the you know it's the it is there is a community spirit. <clears throat> anyway, so then one day he tells Christine he's going out to buy paper, and off he goes. And then Christine notices, this is the grandma, notices there's a smell in the house. And uh, let's see how long that was before that, that, that happened. Yeah. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, it was the fourth time that the police visited the house, not the third time. My God. You know, the police got took a lot of stick for not finding Tia before. 
there was um, inquiries and they apologized and you know there was a it was a big sort of scandal if you like uh, now bear in mind do you know do you, when you saw Stuart Hazel being interviewed then he gosh he can't only be that age so he was born in 1975 he was born in 1975 Oh, God, you know, he was only about 40 then when he uh, in that interview. My God, he looked a lot older, doesn't he? That's what drugs will do to you, I suppose. Um, anyway, so, yeah, he said to Christine, he was going out to buy paper. Christine smelt something and uh, phoned the police. And uh, the police came and this final sort of fifth time, Oh, no, it was the fourth time when they discovered. Yeah, so they'd already searched three times. And this was the fourth time now that they discovered Tia's body in uh, the loft, all wrapped up in a, 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 bag, a, a sheet and bin bags, etc. And Stuart Hazel then was being hunted by the police because he'd gone out to buy a paper, so he was not there. Uh, they then arrested Christine, the grandma. The police arrested the grandma on suspicion of murder. And then they arrested, of course, the neighbour who had said that he'd seen Tia walk it. Because obviously then when they found the body, they realised that he can't possibly have seen Tia. So they were both arrested and then they put out, they were searching for uh, Stuart Hazel. Now, I think I've got some CCTV somewhere. Yeah. That's just, God, just too much. That one can go down. So he was finally caught because he was by, he bought a bottle of vodka and the um, the shop assistant realised who he was. And this was a CCTV of him in this shop buying a bottle of vodka. He was rambling. He was already drunk when he went in there to get the vodka. He was rambling you know, saying that everybody was accusing him of this, that and the other. Uh, and anyway, they phoned the police. The police sort of searched the local area. And actually, it was a dog that found him, a police dog that found him. He was hiding in the bushes somewhere in the um, locally to this store. He was hiding in some trees, etc. And good old police dog that found him. And he was arrested. And that was the end of it for Stuart Hazel. I wonder what this woman was thinking there. She was probably thinking, oh, my God, I can't wait till he goes. And then I'm going to ring the police. So he was finally caught. But unfortunately, this sort of horror didn't stop there. Because then when they went and searched the house, uh, some very good police work, uh, uh, they found... Um, a memory card tucked in a door like in a door frame and so some policemen you know found that so you know the police do do good things as well they could have found Tia's body you know three times that they went to the house but anyway but they found this tiny little memory card in a in the door frame and on that memory card there were some really really awful pictures there were pictures of Tia, probably deceased, they think deceased, but posed in sexual ways. There were pictures of him doing things to himself, like, you know, and video in it, like, for some unknown reason. There was video of him standing over Tia's bed and filming her while she slept. Those video of Tia putting moisturizer on her herself on her legs, you know, there was lots of different things that made it clear that gradually Stuart Hazel was becoming obsessed with Tia as she got older. 
he was developing a, a, an obsession with her, really. So, you know, it was, I suppose, in a way, it was always going to end one way, wasn't it? When he was so obsessed with her poor little thing and she was totally oblivious to it. She thought he was her granddad, she could trust him. You know, you could just see uh, from the footage before she died on that day on the bus in the shop. Um, if she trusted him so implicitly, uh, it's sad, isn't it? It just shows you how these monsters, how they can be so uh, convincing. You know, she trusted him, the family trusted him, everybody trusted him. Nobody suspected anything, did they? So, you know, it's just a shame for Tia, of course. Uh, right. Sorry. I'm just turning... Uh, oh, I think I turned the wrong one off then. Hang on. So... So, he was arrested. And that was it. So that was the only good thing that you could say is he was caught. Um, and that was the end of him. He was uh, found guilty. Uh, he hasn't been given a life tariff, as far as I know. Uh, let's have a look what his sentence is. Uh, let's see. Oh, and Christine just... <coughs> <clears throat> the grandmother was released without charge. So she had nothing to do with it. She knew nothing about it. I expect it was horrible for her to uh, find that out. But I've got something else to tell you about Christine and also Tia's mum, Natalie, that, you know, that they did themselves. Like they did end up getting convictions, but not in this case. For something else later on. Uh, so he, oh, and he first of all pled not guilty. He, I mean, it's you know this is normal, I suppose, for people that commit murder. They normally do plead not guilty, but he pled not guilty, which of course meant a trial, meant all the evidence had to come out, which uh, you know was very distressing the videos of Tia after she was dead etc so anyway he did change his plea after six days he changed his plea to guilty which at, le at least meant they didn't have to go through any more you know torture he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 38 years but meaning he'll be 75 years old before he's il eligible for uh, parole. So I suppose, I suppose that's quite a long sentence, but it just doesn't seem enough. What, you know, it should be life, life without parole. You know, this, he is a predator. Um, and where, what's he going to do when he's 75 years old? You know, when he, he and he comes out, what's he going to do? Just leave him in there. Anyway, so the home where they lived has been demolished now and more houses have built, been built um, on the site. So, you know, uh, they quite often do that with these sort of notorious sites of murder, don't they? They uh, like where Holly and Jessica died with the Ian Huntley, when Ian Huntley uh, murdered them. That's been demolished. Of course, Cromwell Street, Fred and Rose West House, that's been demolished. So they quite often do that, don't they? They've demolished the Idaho house now over in America. And they do, you know, it's awful that they have to do it because it's to stop people going to have a look at it, I suppose, and this, that, and the other. But um, I don't know, just the memory of it, I suppose, is just enough that it should be. Right, now I'm looking for an interview with um, her dad because Stephen Carter, Tia's dad, I mean, God knows how he would have felt. He blames himself uh, and because he, 
you know, we've said this before, when somebody murders someone, it's always everybody else blames himself. And the father of Tia Stephen, he blames himself because he says that if his relationship with Tia's mother hadn't broken down, um, you know, this would never have happened, which is true. But, you know, you can't really blame yourself, can you? But um, let's see if I can find that interview with him. I did have an interview up there, but I think I've turned it off. Let's have a look. So I think, actually, from what um, Tia's mum said, she said that he disappeared before she was born. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the ins and outs were of the relationship. He's uh, had another child now because Tia was his only child at the time when this happened, but he is in a new relationship now and he does have another child. Let's just have a look at this video. Right, we've got a little, this is the statement that uh, Tia's dad made outside the court after the, um, after the verdict. I'm glad that Stuart Hayes would change his plea to guilty this morning. The four days of trial have been very hard to deal with. Hearing the vile things Hazel did to Tia... Hazel will be sentenced tomorrow. In my opinion, it would not be enough. He should serve his time, then be hung. I would like to thank the Metropolitan Police for securing this conviction. Also, in particular, my family liaison, Gavin Seeley, and the officer in charge, DCI Nick Scola. I do not see today's events as justice for Tia, merely a legal conviction. I would now, like, I would now ask to be left alone so I can grieve and put my life back together. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. These, I, I always just don't know how people get over things, you know, like that. You can't imagine how if that happened to you, how would you ever get over it? But um, anyway. Hmm. Okay, now I want to show you. So something that I actually didn't know, but Tia's mum and grandma they were actually had to go to court a couple of years later um, for racial abuse. So let's have a look. This is Tia's mum. Now, it could well be that just the fact of what happened to Tia affected them in some way, but um, I don't know. But... So, the mother and gran of murdered schoolgirl Tia Sharp were found guilty of punching and abusing another shopper in a racist attack over a car parking space. So, Natalie Sharp, that's her, only 34 when that, so when was this? This was in 2016, so another seven years. So, she's only just 40 or just over 40 now. Uh, but, you know, she looks a little bit aggressive, doesn't she, let's say. Um, so she punched and kicked Kosovan Selveti Selmani outside a Lidl in Wallington, South London on April 18th, the year before. She denied a charge of racially aggravated common assault but was found guilty at Croydon Crown Court. So you can see the sort of environment um, that Tia was living in. That's why she went to her grandma's for a refuge and then ended up being murdered by her granddad. I mean, it's a tragedy. That that little girl, what's, you know, she there was no safe refuge for her. It It's just, oh, it drives you mad. Um, and also, Tia's grandmother, Christine Bicknell, 50, of Croydon, South London, she also denied racially aggravated harassment, but she was convicted also. Now, there's her. So she's taking a picture of whoever's taking a picture of her with a fag in her hand. Um, 
there were children in the car when this incident happened there were the children of uh, Tia's mum were in the car so Bicknell and Sharp along with two children had been searching for a parking space when they saw the victim parking her Volkswagen Golf in a parent and baby space. During her evidence, Miss Selmani said that while she was in the supermarket, Bitnell shouted, you effing bitch, you're foreign, you don't have kids. She told the jury she couldn't remember if Sharp had said anything during the attack that happened outside after she had gone to confront her over a scratch on her car so this is what was well say it wasn't alleged because they were convicted of it uh while they've gone you know they've had this argument over the parking space gosh she'd be quite scary wouldn't she um they've had the argument about the parking space and then while the uh lady is in the supermarket apparently she's come out and there's a scratch on her car and she thinks they've done it uh, which probably they did, to be fair. Uh, and here, here they are coming up, as I say, taking pictures of whoever's taking pictures of them, I suppose. She didn't say anything. She just kept hitting me, she said. The driver, who was Christine Bicknell, was laughing at me. I remember she was still in the car and I remember she was laughing at me. I thought she was going to kill me. And Miss Selmani was left with a black eye and swelling and bruising on both cheeks. Now, Natalie has obviously been through a terrible trauma with losing Tia. But really, this I think this tells you something, doesn't it, about the environment that Tia was living in. So uh, Sharp was sentenced to... Oh, so Miss Selmani was left with a black eye and swelling and bruising on both cheeks. Sharp was sentenced to complete 60 hours unpaid work in the next 12 months in order to pay £40 compensation. And Bracknell was ordered to do 40 hours unpaid work. She wasn't called Bracknell, it was Bicknell, wasn't it? Yeah, Bicknell, they've put the wrong name there. Bicknell was ordered to do 40 hours unpaid work in the next year and both had to pay a £60 victim surcharge. So now it could be, you know, that that's how, um, uh, you know, how has it left? Is it because of the trauma that they they've been left with or whatever? But you know, that's to actually get into an argument. Listen, people argue about parking, don't they, all the time? I think probably parking causes a lot of arguments. Anything to do with driving causes a lot of arguments. Is lots of different sort of road rage uh, things but to actually leave someone with a black eye um is is quite serious isn't it you know a black eye and swelling and bruising on both cheeks so she's really you know it wasn't just a, a slanging match or just even having a go at her about being foreign it was more than that and i found this other uh website so there's quite a lot of pictures of them on here of Tia's mum and grandma you know it's uh I don't know well they're, they're finding it hilarious here they're laughing away here but um I just think it's a climate of of violence and you know that's Unfortunately, what Tia was trying to run away from. Uh, but not knowing that um, Stuart Hazel was like a bloody crocodile, a snake waiting to strike. Yeah. Poor Tia. Poor Tia. Anyway, rest in peace, Tia. So that's the story of Tia Sharp. The only good thing, if you like, that came out of it was that Stuart Hazel will be 75 before he ever gets out of prison again. Oh, I just want to show you this. So while he was on remand, he sent his father a letter, Stuart Hazel, 
begging for forgiveness, uh, saying how sorry he was, truly, truly sorry. Let's have a look. You know, I think when these um, twonks sort of do things like this, uh, have mercy on my soul, even though it doesn't deserve it. Love always, your son Stuart. So this is to his father, his father that was in and out of prison, and that's how he ended up in care and probably where it all... You know, these things are generational, aren't they? It's like Tia's almost a victim of his his background, you know, and what had happened to him. Uh, and here he is writing this letter to his father. I'm truly, I'm sorry, truly, truly sorry. But, you know, what he's truly, truly sorry for is that he's been caught. I'm sure if he thought he could have, if that night, if what would have happened that night was he made some advances to Tia and she did not put up her fight, uh, I'm sure he would have just carried on doing it, wouldn't he? He would have carried on doing it. Um, he's sorry because it all went wrong. He couldn't control himself. Um, and not only did it, if the, the thing is, you know, you think, well, all right, he's done it in this moment of drunken sort of whatever. But then he's taken pictures of her, uh, you know, in suggestive poses after she's dead. He's then lied through his teeth, uh, you know, instead of just, you know, I suppose it'd be difficult to own up to something like that. But he's, he's, he's wrapped her in black bin bags and put her in the attic so that when she was actually found, they couldn't even establish a cause of death because by the time she was found, she'd decomposed so much. And they thought, think in the end that it was probably smothering. But um, it was difficult because the body had decomposed so much. He did that. That That's not, um, you know, someone who's sorry, is it? That's someone who's trying to cover the traces. I don't know what he thought he was going to do in the end with uh, Tia's body. I suppose he was hoping that one day when all the furore died down, you know, that he might be able to smuggle it out or something. I don't know. Or, He's not the sharpest tack in the in the tin, but <clears throat> so he wrote to his father. Oh, he's in Belmarsh, by the way. You know, which is a very he won't be having a great time in there, I'm sure, because Belmarsh Prison is notorious, isn't it? You know, I'm not a bad person. It's the Hazel curse. I've only got myself to blame. One mistake, and my whole world has collapsed. Well, he had made more than one mistake because he had been in prison three times before. Anyway, and apparently he had a reputation locally of being a real hard man. People were scared of him, you know, so it wasn't really one mistake, was it, Stuart? And the court also heard forensic evidence which suggested that a small, heavy stain of tears blood was found on a belt belonging to Hazel. They also found two areas of possible semen stains on the floor in Tia's bedroom. One of them matched Hazel's DNA. Only one? What? Whose was the other, for God's sake? Oh, my God. Do you know, it's, this, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? You know, just to think what that poor girl, who should have been safe, uh, you know, and she wasn't. She didn't even know she wasn't. She was being watched. And bloody, you know, God knows what was going on when she was asleep. Anyway, in this letter to his father, he apologises and says he knows that Tia's family will not forgive him and that her death was an accident. He says, I should have told police everything. They're trying to say it was sexual. I promise you it wasn't. Of course it was sexual. They found the pictures. For God's sake, so he's still lying. Even as he's apologising and saying how sorry he is, he's still lying and saying it wasn't sexual. Of course it was sexual. What happened, I will explain in time. But put it this way, it was an accident and I panicked. Stupid, I know, but for my stupidity, I'm looking at 15 to 18 years. Well, you've got a lot more than that. He thought he was only going to get 15 to 18 years. 
I regret it every second of every day. I'm sure he does regret it because he regrets it because it's ruined his life. I don't think he regrets it because of Tia or anybody else. I know Christine and her family will never forgive me. I'm truly, truly sorry. He said he wanted to kill himself and he asked God for mercy. God, have mercy on me. Don't listen to the papers like everyone else. I will tell you all in time. God, I hate myself. I think about ending my life because if I don't, someone will. That's definite. And he asked him to send him some money saying, I've got no money, no fags, no hope. And he drew a picture of a sad face in the letter which was intercepted by prison authorities. Just incredible that he would say that it's not to do with uh, sex. Come on. So he can't even tell the truth, uh, you know, at any time. Okay. Now, where am I going now? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, of course, the reason that I came to do, the, do this video, to talk about this case, was because <coughs> was because of um, the Madeleine Soto case. So this is, you know, the, the very so they're very similar, aren't they? They're similar cases. This was a, a sort of granddad. Uh, this one I think is worse. The Tia Sharp one is worse because he had a relationship over years with Tia. She called him granddad. Um, you know, she she he built up that relationship with her over the years. I, I think that's worse, but they're both as bad as each other. Now, Madeline Soto, it's her stepfather. Though, well, say stepfather, they're not married. Uh, her mother and uh, Stefan Stearns, they're not married, but um, I think they were living together. So he's another one. So Madeline had just turned 13. She'd just had a birthday just a few days before. Is it? Is this like, you know, when they have a birthday, do these twonks think, oh, well, you know, they're a year older now. This is the time I should, you know, make my move or whatever. Anyway, uh, he has been arrested. The stepfather has been arrested. But I just wanted to show you, uh, we talked about it the other day. Hi, Silver Soul. We talked about it the other day and um, I wanted to, there's a couple of things that I want to show you. One is an interview with the mother that I thought I'd showed you, but when I look back at the video, I realised I hadn't shared it, where the mother is being interviewed by Fox News and this guy, uh, Stefan Stearns, comes very chillingly and sits behind her and he's cracking his knuckles and it's awful, you know, to see the threat there while the mother just looks confused, doesn't know what's going on. Because, of course, there's all this talk that maybe the mother was involved because she said that uh, both her and the stepfather had dropped Madeline off at school. We dropped her off at school, but how did they drop her off at school? Because... He's murdered the, the girl. So I, th I personally think the stepfather has made her say that. But, you know, that will all come out in the wash. The mother has not been arrested, by the way. So we're going to look at that first. Maddie. Well, um, Monday morning, we took her to school. We dropped her off close to school across the street from a church, which is very, it's right next to the school. Um, she crossed the street um, and walked to school, what we thought walked to school. Um, my boyfriend who drove her to school walk, drove away at that point. Um, it was See, I just can't make my mind up about this mother I do feel like, you know, she looks like she's lying there Because of the way she's looking up, thinking about it too much But is she lying because she knew that he he's done it Or is she lying because he's told her to lie 
Now watch this now, any moment now, he comes in and sits behind very threateningly, I think. It was seen on video footage that she hung out oh. in the parking lot of the church for a few minutes and then got up and walked towards the school. But she never made it that walk from, and that was around 9 a.m. when she got up. Uh, she never made it to school after that. Um, it's right next to the school. I don't know why she didn't make it. I don't know if something happened on her walk along the way or if she got taken. So he's like sat there all threatening, isn't he? It's like he's listening, making sure she's giving the right story. So, you know, I don't... I honestly don't think the mother knew what he'd done, although perhaps in her head she did. But he said to her, um, you know, to say that, whatever, and she's believed him for whatever reason. But, of course, now that he's been arrested, I expect she is, you know, telling the truth. But she never made it. And that um, was the last anyone's seen of her or heard from her? Yes, Um I went to pick her up after school um, and she wasn't there. He's cracking his knuckles in the background. He sat there actually cracking his fist knuckles. And look, she's looking sort of to the side. Is that like a warning or something from him? Makes you wonder if there's domestic violence in this relationship because the way he sat there cracking his fist knuckles and she's looking to the side, uh, probably because she can probably see him in her um, picture, you know, she looks terrified, I think. But, you know, I don't know. I, you know, what do you think? Do you, do you think she was actually in on it? I don't think she was in on it. I think he's told her to lie for him and she's been a fool and done it. Um. So I started driving around, trying, maybe thinking she took a walk. Maybe she decided to walk to my mom's office, which is pretty close to the school as well. Drove around and I didn't see anything. I drove back to the school. The school was closed. I emailed one of her teachers. They confirmed that she was absent all day. At that point is when I called 911 because I realized something was truly wrong. Have you heard from, like, any of her friends? Has she been active on any social media? She hasn't been active on social media, none of her chats, none of her games. Uh, we did contact all her friends. None of them had seen her Monday or heard from her. Um, yeah, there's no update. Uh, and I have to ask this, and I know I, I hate doing it, but is she the type that would run away? Has this happened in the past or anything? Has she ever threatened to, to run away? Never. She's never, ever mentioned anything like this before. And she's not the type to want to do this. Um, she did accidentally leave her phone on Monday, um, which is kind of normal for her. She's got ADHD and very forgetful. Um so she left her phone at home, so there's no way to trace her. They tried tracing her school laptop, um, but that's off, so it's not pinging to anything. Jen, what what is your fear? I know you mentioned she's on games and stuff. Do you think she could have, like, met somebody and tried to meet up with them? From She's open to us. She's open with us about, you know, if she's got a crush with anyone. And she told us she had a crush on someone at school. Um, and I looked at their messages. Nothing was weird. I looked at... All of her messages, all of her deleted messages. As she said, she told us that she had a crush on someone at school. Well, he wouldn't have liked that, would he? You know, <coughs> he's got his eye on uh, himself, you know, and uh, he wouldn't have liked that at all when, he, he, when she said she had a crush at someone. You know, that could have been the catalyst for it because the thing is, he's... He, and there'd be a catalyst for what's happened. There'd be an argument or something like these reports that had been abusing her already for a couple of years. <clears throat> so what led to sort of it actually, you know, turning into M-U-R-D-E-R? There'd be a catalyst. Could be that, could it? Could it be that, that she said that she liked someone at school, he'd go mad, wouldn't he? He'd go mad. I think this is really weird how he sits in the background. It's so creepy. You know, if you you know that the mother, I mean, obviously we know now that he has had something to do with it, 
but why is he sat there right on camera? You know, it's like he wants to be on the camera. It's not, I mean, to be fair, he could have threatened her from the other side of the camera. He could have just sat there and been, so, you know, but the fact of him sitting there wanting to be on camera, it's really odd. Oh, and for those of you who don't know, he worked at Disney World. Bloody P, working at Disney World. Unfortunately, these people, child lovers, they gravitate towards jobs that bring them close to children. That's what they do. Nothing seemed weird. It didn't seem like she was talking to anyone. Um, so I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like she may have been taken um, because this is not like her at all to just disappear and not tell us, not let us know where she's going or who she's with. Um, yeah. What What are you getting from law enforcement? I mean, are they actively searching for her? I mean, what, what happens now? I mean, especially that she doesn't have her phone with her. Um, so as far as I know, they're conducting a search around the school, behind the school. There's a Shingle Creek. There's a, a wooded path area that you could walk. Uh, it's a hiking path. They are going back there with their canine dogs. Uh, they've taken a piece of her clothing to see if they can trace her scent. Um, they're also taking their own vehicles. I'm not sure what type of vehicles, but they're going into the woods to search for her. Um, but I don't feel like that's going to find anything right now. We've had people all day on that trail sending us photos to see if anything there looks familiar and like her personal belongings and nothing is hers. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to go from here. I'm just contacting the news to get the word out, to get some help because I'm desperate. I, I'm a wreck right now. So you think that she's been taken against her will? I do think so, yes. As a mom, you know, what is your what's your mother's intuition telling you right now? I'm trying to hope for the best, but well, I wish her mother's intuition would have told her that this guy is a twonk for God's sake. You know, uh, do you think I mean maybe he's just really good at covering up. We're going to look at um uh, he's a, a video of his best friend talking about him in a moment. Maybe he is just good at covering it up and maybe he could have fooled anyone. I don't know. Because you, you, you do, you think, like with uh, Stuart Hazel, you think, how could they have thought he was a suitable person to have around Tia, to leave Tia on her own with him? How could they have thought that when they knew his background? But... You know, he's a drug dealer. He's been in and out of prison. He's had a machete. He's been charged with possession of a machete, threatening someone with a machete. And and he, he was allowed around Tia. Not only around her, but to actually babysit for her, you know, to have her around there on her, on her own. Same with this guy. It's like, is, are they that clever, really, that you don't see it? You know, it, may, it just makes you wonder. I think this mother seems, you know, genuinely concerned. Uh, it's, I do think that sometimes people, not only women, they just see what they want to see. And if they've decided that someone's a good person, they just can't see anything bad about them. They just can't admit it to themselves. I'm just... I'm scared for her. Oh. I want her to be okay. I want her to be safe. I don't want. I don't want her to come back harm. I, I just. I just want her back. Whatever that means. Just. I just. Want I want her back. Whatever that means. I mean, look at him there, and all the time he's sat behind, knowing what he's done to. He's probably reliving it in his mind right now. As he sat there like the fucking, um, sorry, excuse my friend. He sat there like the Grim Reaper, isn't he? Or some sort of, ooh, Nosferatu or something behind her, like so chillingly sort of threatening. Uh, while she's crying um, and he knows exactly where Madeline is and what's happened to her. Are you getting any updates from law enforcement? I mean, yes, they're searching that small area, but have they gotten any hits on any scent or anything like that? 
they haven't let me know anything. They haven't updated me since I spoke to them this morning. I've contacted them to get some information or to give them. And not only that, it's got the brass neck to sit there on the camera. Do you know, he, this is Fox News. He knows that, you know, loads of people are going to be watching this. And he's sat there like, what is wrong with him? Bloody hell. Them some leads, but I've heard nothing <laughs> back. And Jen, there's no way that she just being, you know, a teenager was like, maybe had a fight with you or an argument with you and was like, you know what, I'm going to go hang out at so-and-so's house and teach her a lesson. You know, could that be a scenario? I don't believe so. We actually haven't gotten into a fight. Casually having a little drink, a sip of his tea or whatever. Well, she's crying on the camera to Fox News because her daughter's gone missing and he knows exactly what's happened to her. Oh my God, this guy is chilling. Absolutely chilling. Fight in like a few weeks or arguments or anything like that. If anything, on Sunday, she celebrated her 13th birthday with my entire family and she had the best day. She was oh. so happy. She showed us all her gifts. Um, she was, she's just a happy girl and she showed it on, on Sunday night when she went to bed. She was so happy. So, you know, she had the best day. I just, you know, there was no, there was no moment in that evening from when she got home from the party that she had her phone or had the laptop. She went straight to getting ready and went to bed. So I know she didn't have any conversations with anyone. She didn't make plans with anyone. I didn't, I didn't see any of that. But yeah. she's spent the whole Sunday celebrating her 13th birthday was her 13th birthday on that sunday or that was just like the, the time you guys were celebrating that was the time we were celebrating her birthday was on thursday the 22nd okay, she just so turned 13. but that's just so heartbreaking to be celebrating her 13th birthday and then the very next day She's that's gone. the last you you see it, you've seen her for her. yeah yeah look at yeah. where where do you go now are, are you gonna god i i just I'm a bit speechless. Can I go out there and, and search or look or what, what is your, are you sticking by the phone? Are you, you know, what are you doing? I'm staying at home, staying by the phone, hoping she just appears. Um, I know my entire family is out looking. They've all uh, spread a bunch of flyers. They've gone, I, I've had people contact me that they've gone to the international airport to spread flyers to Amtrak, to Greyhound, just any way that, if someone's taking her and they're trying to take her just to show her face, just to make sure, you know, she's not being taken against her will. And you mentioned ADHD. <clears throat> Was there anything else maybe mentally going on or that, that you knew of? Um, she does suffer from anxiety. And once upon a time, she was diagnosed with autism. Uh, we had her re... What's the word? Maybe. Reevaluated. Okay. We had her reevaluated um, a few months ago, actually, and they told us no, she didn't have autism, but she did have some autistic traits. She did have ADHD, some autistic traits, but not autism. So I'm not sure where to leave with that because one doctor said she did, and one doctor saying she doesn't, and I don't know. She's just in the middle, I guess. She because she does have some tendencies, but socially she's pretty great. So I'm not sure. And with the video that you were able to see whenever your boyfriend dropped her off, where where was that? What like which video? Was that a surveillance camera? It was a surveillance camera from the church, uh, Peace Church, right next to Meta. Yeah, I thought she said we dropped her off. Now I'm saying when your boyfriend dropped her off. So <clears throat> there's a lot of. Um inconsistencies isn't there in what she's saying but it's just i think the the question is is she sort of complicit or is it you know just because she's scared of him and that's what's got to come out as far as i know she's not been charged with anything yet uh hunter's peak middle school and do you have that video i don't have that. um they didn't show me they wouldn't show me that it was actually they, they, my sister was the one at location and they were letting her know what they saw on camera. Okay. Uh, but they didn't show it to any of us. Got it. Okay. 
Jen, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add? <sighs> please, 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 if you have any information, contact me, contact law enforcement. Um, any, any information helps. Um, Maddie, if you see this, please come home. Please be safe. I love you very much. If you have my Maddie, please just let her come home. We just want her home. So, some sense. Then, of course, very shortly afterwards, uh, Maddie was sadly, her body was found. So, as far as I'm concerned, jury's out on the mother. I can't make my mind up whether I believe her or not, or, you know, but it'll all come out in the wash, I suppose. Okay, now we're going to look at the, uh, somebody sent me, one of my subscribers sent me, thank you so much, a link to this video, um, which is very interesting. So this is another YouTube channel. What's it called? Sorry, what's Grey Hughes Investigates. I don't know this YouTube channel. Uh, I think I've subscribed. Oh, no, I haven't yet. I meant to. Oh, I have. I have. Have I? I subscribed? Yeah, I have subscribed. Um, and it's a true crime YouTube channel. And while they were doing a phone in, his ex-friend called in. So I hope you won't mind me using this. I mean, I'll put credit in the description box using this as uh, fair use. I'm going to use a little bit of it to show you what his friend had to say about him. Stefan Michael Stearns, who is the boyfriend of Madeline's mother. Now, during the show, we had live call-ins, and one of Stefan's ex-roommates and ex-friends called and described stuff he looks a bit scary in that photo doesn't he you know like you know we always say it's all in the eyes the eyes are the windows to the soul he looks a bit weirdy there doesn't he a bit scary well he looked he was scary when he was stood behind the mother in that in the kitchen fun in some interesting details and different events that happened when he knew him all right so if you guys could hit that like button i would really appreciate it and also during the video, if you think of anything, put your comment in the comment section. And if you like my content, uh, consider subscribing to my channel. And if you do so, hit the subscribe button, then the notification bell and all videos. Yeah, so go over to his channel, give him a subscribe or a like. Um, you know, I've, I've, to be honest, it's not. I have very little time to watch other YouTube channels. That's the. I have my favourites. I like that chapter, and I like Coffee House Crime, and they're really probably the only YouTube channels that I watch on a regular basis. I mean, I do dip in if something comes up. I like because I watch a lot of the news channels, obviously, to get news and things, News Nation, etc. So sometimes I just haven't got time to, but I, I really appreciate it when people send me links that, you know, so I, I, I that are in, uh, uh, what's the word, when they send me links that are sort of connected to cases that I'm covering. So I was very grateful to get this link because I would never have found this channel. And without further ado, as my mom would say, here is that call. Yeah, I was that kid. So that was scary, wasn't it? That picture of him on his Facebook or whatever, and there's Madeline there, reflected in his sunglasses. Very scary. The best friend for like a decade. Yeah, so we had a falling out like 12 years ago, but he still floats in the same circles because he, he moved up and down the state, apparently, like doing real estate with his mom and dad. But he started working for Disney, and I know he's still working there in like September but I don't think he's working there anymore because Disney made a statement or something about it. He was actually in the T-Rex area at, at Epcot, I think. I think that's where he worked. I don't know if, like, he's not working. I mean, he could have quit after September, but I know in September he's still working there because he had pictures on his Instagram because people always send me crap about him because we were best friends for so long. This is his mugshot. 
his eyes are dead aren't they his eyes are dead there's nothing there you go into hell you're going to hell and you know it for what you've done along and then we had a falling out because he drew a gun on me over a disagreement so so there you go he drew a gun on his friend over a disagreement that's why they don't they haven't spoken for 12 years oh i just cut ties with him completely but some of the stuff that kid did growing up was so crazy. So a year after we stopped being friends, one of our mutual friends was going through hard times and needed a cheap place to live. So he moved in with him. And this kid's like an IT wizard. So essentially what happened is a year after that, they had a falling out. And I convinced my buddy to tell me what happened. And apparently what happened was he had been cleaning up the network and found a shared folder between their computers where Stefan had been secretly hiding a camera in his room and recording his girlfriend coming in and out of the shower. Oh, dude. So he was his roommate for, for quite a while, lived with him, I think it was seven years, he said, didn't he? And then he said that the, the next roommate he had, it, it found out that he was, um, he'd set up a secret camera and was recording his girlfriend coming in and out of the shower. Bloody hell. Thing is, though, what, why was it hope? Why was that not reported to the police? Oh, it was. Oh, that's right. They did. They did challenge him about it, and uh, his parents paid this guy off. I'd forgotten. Yeah, uh, um, he's going to. And and from what I understand, there was kid stuff on there as well. Oh. And like I said, my buddy was going through a really hard time. At like literally broke. And uh, from what I understand, his mom paid, Stefan's mom paid off my buddy to not talk about it. And so he was cleaning up the network and found images. So supposedly his mummy paid off the guy uh, to not say anything about it, which, Joe, I, I know the guy probably was desperate for money, and uh, but there was child pee on there as well. So not only was recording his girlfriend he of course should have reported it because some well it always ends up with something like what's happened doesn't it you know these predators they sometimes start off with the voyeurism and the you know maybe exhibitionism or this that and the other and they end up with murder so he could have maybe been nipped in the bud earlier but i don't know i just said this Stefan guy's a kind of a moron, isn't he? I mean, I mean, he does yeah, this like, something like all of us are friends. We so like a lot of us old friends from high school. They've all been blowing me up for like the last two days about all this, and that's kind of the agreement we've all come to. Too, <laughs> we're like, wow, he was actually really, really dumb. Like all of this is so stupid. Like it's 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 kind of crazy because he didn't. I mean, he was kind of a smart kid, but. He he had social issues a little bit, but I mean he he partied. I, I was like I threw parties all the time, and he always came out and partied. I mean he was all me and him were basically attached at the hip. We lived together. We lived in the same room for like five years. That's why all this is so crazy to see all this going down and just like the amount of people that are flooding me constantly about it. But his mom was. I mean his dad is pretty normal. It always seemed like his dad didn't like the rest of the family and his brother seemed to distance himself from the i mean i knew this kid we we're attached at the hip for a better part of a decade and i don't know the moms always get the blame don't they always say also his mom it, you know his dad was normal it was all his mom but i never once saw his brother i think his brother was military or something like that well what can you tell us about like so how, long you, how long do you know this guy for uh I moved I moved here from Japan when I was like 17 so probably until I was 20 Oh sorry that's the wrong book 7 we be, and we lived together for probably 6 7 of those years Wow so like what can you tell like you know remembering back what what do you know about him I mean just how was he like when you go well, to bars and the girls and whatever you know Yeah all that was like I mean there's one time recently, and that's because she actually messaged me today. She's married with kids now and everything like that. But there was one girl who messaged me. And 
we didn't let him bring her to parties. I mean, he had to be 20, probably 20 at the time. And he was dating a girl who was 17. So he was 20 and he was dating a girl that's 17, which really three years, you think, oh, that's not that big a difference, is it? But it feels like a big difference at that age. Like if someone who was 30 was dating someone who was 27, it wouldn't seem that bad, would it? Um, but obviously at the time they felt that that was quite a big difference. But when you listen to what he's got to say in a minute, she actually was not even 17. And we were like, no, 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 sorry, she's not allowed. So none of us really interacted with her. So I don't really know too much about that. But we do know he was dating a young girl. And what did she look and like? We, none of us. Was she really she was young? Asian. Oh, she was Asian and really small then? Yeah, she was tiny and Asian, yeah. Okay. She was literally tiny and Asian. I mean, four foot, four eleven maybe. Hmm. Well, my wife's only, she's, she's a, a really a small. She's only like four foot. Yeah. Five or and this seven girl was too. She was super tiny, and uh, I mean, so we thought that was a little weird. But this girl had messaged me earlier today, and she made a comment about that same thing that I'm saying now. And we were all told she was 17. She told me today on Instagram that she was 14 at the time. So oh, that wow. dramatically changes all of that. <laughs> oh wow! That so the same girl that he told you was 17 was only 14. Yeah, because wow. she mentioned that today in the Instagram. Wow, that's insane. So, yeah, so actually she was only 14. So he was already starting then, wasn't he, at the age of 20. Uh, and again, even six years, if somebody's 40 and someone's 34, six years is not a big age. You know, I'm a great believer in... Um, you know, I've been out with uh, men that are quite a lot older than me and I've been out with men that are younger than me, but uh, not when I was, like, 20. You know, it's it, it, the age differences become less important as you get older, if you like, because at least they're a mature person. You know, if, if somebody's 30 going out with someone who's 40, whether it be man or woman, the person is 30. So 30 is mature you know it's not like a a 16 year old 16 year old going out with someone who's 26 because a 16 year old has not got the maturity do you see what i mean so uh he was already liking young girls then i wonder if he actually targeted uh, maddie's mom because she had a daughter so what was this part about you a gun up above? I think I missed that. I was trying to. Oh yeah, business. so we were living together. Um, I don't know, probably a couple of years into. I mean, this was at the end of our relationship. So we had a disagreement because there was a lot of issues wrong with the house. We were renting through his dad, and uh, I didn't want to pay rent because oh, like a whole bunch of these issues, AC, garage, all these things hadn't been fixed, and my car was pinned in the garage, and this went on for like months. So finally, I refused to pay rent. I was like, look, you got to fix these issues. I'm like, this can't go on any longer. I'm not paying rent until you fix these issues. And uh, his son flipped out on me because I guess his dad was giving him a hard time trying to get Stefan to give me to give the money to pay the rent. And I was just like, no, not until you fix these problems. And Stefan flipped out the house through a temper tantrum. And I, I mean a legit, like, <laughs> three-year-old temper tantrum laying on the ground, oh, a geez. grown man <laughs> pounding and kicking him. His feet into the ground and screaming and yelling. And he does all this, proceeds to run into the room, grab his gun and draw a gun on me. Wow. We get into a scuffle after that. I leave. I never come back. My dad gives me money because I'm broke. You know, I'm broke 20 year old at the time, like bouncing between jobs. And he gives me the money to break the lease because I told him what happened. He's like, you need to get out of there. So he gives me the money, break the lease with everything. And I left. So that was the last I talked to the kid personally. Wow. But then a year after that, our mutual buddy moved in, and that's when all the camera stuff and all that went down. But like, uh, you moved back in with him somehow again after that? Even though, you no, know? no, no, no. I, after the gut thing, I never talked to the kid again. Okay. We just float in the same circle. So like every time he hangs out with someone I know or... Yeah, that'll do it. When somebody threatens you with a gun, then you're not likely to talk to him again, are you? So, uh, anyway, 
Yeah, he, he obviously is like quite immature, isn't he? But um, oh, I know not, nothing's going to bring Madeline back, but you only find out these things in hindsight, don't you? You know, if that, that person that was paid off uh, by his mum had gone to the police or, you know, if there was something in his background, maybe that could have saved Madeline. Maybe, couldn't it? Maybe if uh, Madeline's mum, you know, if there was more known about him. But would Madeline's mum have even known about it, you know? This is what... So this goes to the crux of really what all this video is all about, is people should be careful who they let into their households, who they um, let into uh, their children's space. You know, really, probably you should do some sort of background check on them because, you know, you let these people in and they're, they're like just monsters. It, and then they're in your home. You know, they're in your home and they're in a, a privileged position with your children. They've got access to your children. Uh, you should do a background check, really, on, on anyone you're going to bring into your home. Um, not only for your children, but for you, probably. Messages, so when I know, I get all these messages on Facebook or Instagram from, you know, whoever it is. And so how long ago was the server moment where he, he was at work and... Uh Oh, this wasn't at work. This was at the house. Oh, My buddy house. was just like going. Oh. Through, he, so he's like, he loves, he's, he's a rare breed. He loves IT networking. Like he's not good at IT networking. He loves IT networking. Like he loves going through networks and cleaning things and making things move faster and 3D printing. You know, he's just one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was still going through. I was back and to and fro mm -hmm. in the house. It was just like that. Something quick and easy. We were all wired together because we're all gamers. So And so he had like CSAM material and his girlfriend on there. Or his child pornography yeah, 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 yeah. and his girlfriend. Oh. And and my buddy, the IT guy's girlfriend from a hidden camera in their bedroom. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, because he also lived in the house. I don't know if I stated that earlier, but even when I lived there, like we lived together because his dad owned the place. So it was like super cheap rent and Windermere is an expensive town. Well, do you have any other, like... Just shows you when you look at someone, you just don't know what's going on to you in their head. You know, what's going on in their head. Bloody hell. Monsters in plain sight. Times when you were hanging out with them that you were just sort of like, God, that's weird or something like that. Uh, you know, I don't know if you he was... About it, he was very socially awkward other than that. I mean, there I know there was a story that I was told when he first moved here by his own mom. And that was uh, him stabbing a dude when he was like 14 years old. So I'm, I doubt anyone even knows. This happening out. What? So he actually stabbed someone when he was 14 years old. Well, that's a bit of a red flag, isn't it? You know, you stab someone at 14 years old. It's a little bit of a red flag. Maybe you should think there's something strange there. California before his family even moved over here. Um, but he stabbed, I guess, from what I understood, he was walking down the road. He was like 14 years old in California, and some guy had cat called his girl, and he flicked the guy off. The guy was like a drunk 40 year old man, who proceeded to run across the road and beat the living tar out of him. Well, apparently, Stefan, at 14 years old, was one of those kids who carries knives on him, and he stabbed him and missed his heart by like barely a millimeter. Oh, wow. my God. So I almost cut him. That was when he was 14, and I know he had a whole bunch of therapy afterwards because apparently the beating kind of messed with his brain or something where he could, like, fly off the handle really easily. Like, he would... This guy is a walk, was a walking uh, danger sign, wasn't he? I mean, he was a walking time bomb. So at 14, he stabbed someone and just missed their heart. You know, he... <laughs> God, it makes you wonder how many others are out there just waiting to explode. Just get super angry really quick. And I only saw a couple flashes of that during our relationship together. But, I mean, that that was like... But I will say, of that entire family, Dad seemed normal. Mom, on the other hand, is a whole different beast altogether. Like, she raises championship poodles. 
She's the meanest, rudest, loudest, most racist person I've ever, and openly racist. I mean, she doesn't hide it. Just so the mom's getting all the blame again. So she raises poodles. Uh, she's racist. She's mean. She's, you know, I mean, maybe she is. I'm just saying this. Just you know, the dad's like some sort of bloody saint, and the mom's this horrible person. So he's obviously the way he is because of the mom. Obnoxious person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Like my sister used to run a Publix down here and she was hated by the entire staff. I'm like, wow. how do you get hated by a bagger? Like that's hard to do. Yeah. Like, but everyone knew this lady when she walked through the door, she was just, she said she was an ex air force drill sergeant, uh, you know, a, a special forces drill sergeant, no less. I don't know. That could be true. Could be false. Who knows? She was a whole different beast. And like, he was attached to her by the cord like it was really weird their relationship was weird dad seemed to hate the rest of the family dad. yeah dad was like never around but i'm not laughing because it's funny i'm just laughing because it did i mean it, it's probably all true i don't know but just always it's always the mother that gets the blame but ah uh... really dad would pop in like on weekends here and there and he slept in a separate bedroom and then he would go back to doing real estate stuff and disappear for weeks on end down south. And I mean, that was like all the time. Hmm. But dad probably had another woman. <laughs> he probably had another woman to escape from his psychotic wife and son. Probably wanted to get away from his kid. It's, I know. I, my, that's, that's my impression I always had of him was, uh, oh, he doesn't like the wife and he doesn't like the kid. He got dealt a bad hand, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it seems like. And the other the other son, I want to keep calling him Brett for some reason, but I can't remember his name because he never came around. But he, I think he was military and lived in North Carolina, from what I understand. And I think when he had kids, he made an attempt, like sent them pictures of the family on Christmas kind of thing. And that was like the first thing he had done in like 15 years. So I don't know what happened in that family with that side, but I mean, what makes us son disappear from his family for 15 years by choice? Yeah. So it sounds kind of like, I mean, this, this, this search, this arrest warrant, you know, he has the thing about the, you know, he has all those photographs on his phone. So it sort of sounds oh, yeah. kind of similar. The interview but he, where he's cracking his knuckles, he uh -huh. used to do that. Like, so, I mean, we were, uh -huh. we were like popular party kids back in high school. You know, at least me and my circle of friends was, and he was a part of that because he was like my friend. And so we got into a lot of fights with other kids and stuff like that. And that was just something he always did when he like, he had this weird thing about like portraying being the most alpha guy in the room. A lot, a lot, what, what do they say? Um, all uh, he wanted to be the most alpha guy in the room. Yeah. Well, you be an alpha guy, wouldn't you? You know, uh, <clears throat> like uh murdering a 13 year old that really makes you a big man doesn't it bark no bite that was kind of him and he's oh good luck with being an alpha man when you get to prison good luck with being an alpha man then in prison Let's see how you get on then to do that all the time he used to drive us nuts because it pissed everyone off where he would sit there and just start cracking his knuckles non-stop <laughs> and it would be so <laughs> aggravating that was, one of some, that was one of the things we were talking about on Instagram today because we, we had a pretty tight circle of friends. And we've all gone our separate ways, had kids and done all that stuff. And uh, we were, we have an Instagram chat with a lot of us in it. And, you know, obviously he's never been in it, but a lot of us other ones are in it. And we were just all talking today about a whole bunch of stuff. We remember of him back when we were younger and being like, damn, how do we not notice? Like, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. And he'll, what about the uh, part about him? He factory reset his phone. Like we were reading that earlier. <laughs> like what a dumb. Okay. The kid's not that dumb. I could tell, I could tell you that that's a 100% chance. That is a zero possibility chance with the kid. The kid is really smart when it comes to computers. Like I said, at least when it comes to certain things, he's really smart. We're gamers. Like, and we grew up gaming before. Like <clears throat> he wasn't that smart really when he said his, Oh God, sorry. My voice is going, <clears throat> when he set his phone to factory reset, he's not as clever as he thinks he is because even I know, and I know nothing about technology, but even I know you can't, you know, you can't, the police can get things 
off your phone <clears throat> even if you put it to factory reset or not you in fact uh there's not much you can do to stop them getting things off your phone as far as i know you know even i know that and i know nothing you know unless you, you'd have to bloody throw it in water would you and even then could they i don't know you know the internet is the way it is so we used to go in and ch go into the codes and change all of our settings minute, and do though. all that kind of we're like did we you, were really big did you so, play doom now hey we i played the original doom with the uh, i played doom on phone. a floppy disk remember we had to play the phone you had to put the phone and do the uh 9600 bot and then it got to <laughs> 1440 and it was like whoa yeah this is incredible that's it yeah that's crazy yeah but, but yeah but so yeah, obviously so, he mean, factory reset for that to happen he did it yeah. yeah, there was no way. That's a physical impossibility. Like the second I, I mean, I, so we had like a thing in the chat where I saw the video where he was sitting behind the mom in the interview. And when I saw, and I saw that live. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So emotional. Kind of, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it's, and I'm just like, that's a lot. Of, I mean, I haven't talked to these people in like 15 years. <laughs> Have these people are messaging me. <laughs> it's like a reunion, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So it was good. Right, I'm going to fast forward it a bit and just see if he's got anything else interesting. It's kind of crazy, all of us talking about it and just like the things we remember and kind of, you know, obviously. So, I'm gonna, but I know his mom paid him off because my buddy was hurting and my buddy got an apartment right after. You know, he wakes up when he feels like it does whatever work he wants to do. He's just one of those lazy kind of people when it comes to that. Just does whatever he wants. You're talking about stuff. You're talking about him. and daddy and mom. He always bailed him out of every issue he ever had. So, uh -huh. I mean. They moved to the other side of the state to get away from his charges that he had when he was a kid from stabbing that guy. So they moved literally all the way across the state so no one would know him in that town anymore. I wonder, how, I'd love to know how he met Madeline's mom. Probably online, I expect. Um, <clears throat> did he target her because she had children? Um, did she know about all this? You know, did Madeline's mum, I bet she didn't know that he'd been, uh, he'd stabbed someone when he was 14 or, or maybe she did, I don't know. That's what I'd like to know. Did she know about all this weird history of his? Do you think that's a true story that uh, you're, well, did you t talk to your friend? I don't know, that was his mom that told me that. No, so, I'm talking I mean, about like, the, the other story. A long time ago. I'm talking so. about the other one. The one, do you think it's a true story that um, the mom paid off your roommate uh to not show that share i do stuff. yeah so yeah that, that kid i actually trust a lot <laughs> yeah me and that kid have been through thick and thin i mean like he's he's oh, like when, when someone used to go down with the cops and rat one or the other person out and that kid just won't rat someone out he's that kid well what's weird about it is the mom that means she was aware that her son is has a you know propensity Oh, the mom's definitely aware because oh. I called her son all sorts of those names and called her out on all of it to her face. So I definitely know she knows for sure. Oh, yeah. When when, when made you call him that to their face? Like, Okay. I don't think there's anything more that comes out of this now. For it. But, yeah, some interesting information there from his friend or his ex-friend. Um just thought I'd, you'd find that interesting. So it turns out we knew he was a twonk, but now we're finding out he's even more of a twonk than we thought he was in the first place. And, you know, it just makes you wonder, um, did Madeline's mum know all these things about him? Probably not, to be honest, but anyway. Okay, so as Alana was just saying there, there is a little bit, it's, it's not really much news, but there's a little bit of news um, in the Samantha Murphy case that we we'll just have a look at before we go to bed. There's an article, well, I know some of you in Australia, you be just getting up, never mind going to bed. But yeah, they're, what they're saying in the Mail Online Phone twist, you know, the way they put it, phone twist in search for missing mum, Samantha Murphy. Police to try a new tactic in search. And it says they're set to look at mobile phone tower data, which, you know, I thought they were already looking at. Of course, this will be something the police have decided to sort of leak out 
to try and rattle someone in my eyes. I think this is totally deliberate by the police. The 50, oh, so we know that Samantha, unfortunately, uh, went missing on February the 4th to go jogging and hasn't been seen since. Just just for people who maybe don't know this story. And of course, she has not been found. And really, very little information has come out, hasn't it? So the big news is that detectives will now trawl through mobile data from the Ballarat area with particular interest in phones. So these are other phones that pinged from towers covering the zone they believe Miss Murphy was in hours after her run. The phone data could potentially help detectives identify people of interest and provide fresh leads as the search for Ms Murphy enters 30 days. However, analysis of mobile phone tower data could prove challenging due to the number of people that live in the area. So this is a, a very populated area. So they've got a lot to trawl through, haven't they? Phone pinging would pick up people travelling along roads in cars and even those cycling or walking on tracks. And phone metadata has been crucial to the investigation after it pinpointed a precise location in the Mount Clear area, some seven kilometres from her home, about an hour into her jog. So remember, the initial reports claimed her phone pinged off the... Bunyan Yong Tower at 5pm on the day she went missing and this has still not been confirmed by the police but they did release it so it's funny isn't it really because there's only the police that could have released that information for people to talk about it but that information has not been confirmed and of course that's 10 hours after she left for a run that that pinged so Oh, and look, they've got the picture of Mick smiling again. They keep putting this picture up of Mick smiling and then telling us not to speculate. But they want us to speculate, really. I think they're definitely, whether it's deliberate or not, they definitely keep showing this picture of Mick smiling because they want us to think there's something in it. Now, it could be for whatever reason. I personally, you know, of course... The partner is always a suspect. This is Samantha's husband, Mick. Partner is always the first suspect. But I personally hope, against hope, it isn't to do with him, just for the sake of her children. Uh, look, they've put... Uh, Miss... Do you know what? They're, the mainstream media, look what they've done. They've put the picture of him laughing. And then underneath, Miss Murphy's husband, Mick, is not a suspect at this stage. You know, they, they're trying to make it look suspicious. Okay, anyway, that's it. That's really the only update so far. Because, of course, it's daytime there now, so more things might come out as the day progresses. And if they do, I'll let you know in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so another long stream. Gosh, my streams are, uh, uh, there was a lot to say there, a lot to say about Tia and, the, you know, we mustn't forget about Tia and I do, Tia was so let down, Tia Sharp, wasn't she? And it seems like Madeline has been let down the same. Um, you know, you can draw the comparisons between these two cases, between those two twonks. Both people of trust, you know, people trusted, people that um, both Tia and Madeline should have felt safe with, their granddad, their stepfather, or, you know, their acting granddad, their acting stepfather. These are where these, you know, people should feel safe, children should feel safe. So the message is, man or woman, when you take on a new partner, you should check them out definitely and make sure because then when you look into these people's backgrounds you can see all the red flags can't you you know there are red flags bloody there's there's 
things screaming at you to say don't take this person into your house around your children um so that's that's the moral of the tale okay night night thank you so much um everyone's fine i'm falling asleep now i'm like uh, i'm also cold that's why i put my uh scarf around me i'm a little bit chilly i'm a little bit chilly i'm going to bed yes on a happier note manchester city won yes they did yeah yeah two goals from um, phil foden and one from harland but united scored in the first couple of minutes didn't they or something so it looked like it wasn't going to be but uh... so yeah that's why I've got my blue nail varnish on for Manchester City today. Okay, so I will see you tomorrow, I'm sure, at some point, or some news, depends what's going on. I've got classes. Tomorrow's Monday, and it's Monday again. Just like that, it was Monday again. So thanks for spending this Sunday evening with me, and thank you for all your likes. Or don't forget to put your fingerprint on the like button. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Thanks to all my members and everyone who supports my channel. Don't forget to have a look around the other video. I meant to show you the, I keep meaning to show, you know, the playlists and everything. <laughs> There's lots of things that I always think, oh, I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about that. I forgot to talk about the Spanish and stuff. But anyway, never mind. There's always tomorrow. So take care. Sleep well. Remember to live and love wisely, carefully. And until I see you again, may your God go with you. Bye. Night, night.